Hello and welcome to our online event. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dirk Dougal and I'm um, a senior consultant and program director at the fund. Um, I'm joined with three excellent speakers who I will introduce to you in a minute. Um, just a quick thanks to IBM for partnering with us for this event. Um, so as you know, population health is a key priority for us at the fund um, and also for the wider health and care system. You would have seen it in the NHS long-term plan, in the GP contract that came out earlier this year and in our vision for population health um, in November um, 2018. Um, it's, a, it's a really welcome focus and why? because the major challenges that are faced in the health and care system today and also the opportunities presented by data and technology, by innovation, are things that cannot be captured and addressed alone by focusing on ill health, but there needs to be a much more holistic approach to health and well-being. Population health management is one tool and a really important tool um, which really looks at the, the opportunities in terms of data and insights to help planning um, and delivering quality care and improving health and well-being outcomes. So I'm delighted to have today um, an hour to really explore this topic. Um, a number of you have approached us to ask questions over the last six to eight months about this very topic and a diverse range of questions. So now is your opportunity to ask us some questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a box saying ask a question. Do send in your questions. Um, keep them short if you can, but send them in um, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Anything we can't get through, we will share with the panel because it's important for us to see also what your ideas and things that you're working on are so that we can think through our next steps in our work too. Finally, if you're a Twitter user, uh, please do follow our conversation on hashtag KF online. Um, and just a, a warning in terms of language and jargon. Um, as you'll probably know, population health management is a topic that is riddled with lots and lots of jargon. We'll do our best to explain as many of them as we can. Uh, but if there's anything that you feel that you'd really like to know, again, ping us a question and we'll, we'll kind of go into a bit more depth about something that we might have mentioned. Okay, so without any further ado, I am delighted to introduce you to our panel. Um, I'm going to ask our panel members just to say who they are, um, a bit about the work they do, and also why this topic is so important to them. I'm going to start with you, Ad Abraham, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Dirk. So, Abraham George, I'm a consultant in public health at uh, Kent County Council. I have a strategic leadership for health intelligence for our department in, in the public health department in Kent County Council as well as leadership for the Kent Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, or JSNA. Uh, but uh, over the last few years, I've been sort of leading on a project called the Kent Integrated Data Set, which is around bringing data across hundreds of local organizations for the use of population health analytics. Um, and needless to say, that's been quite a, uh, quite a ground, uh, groundbreaking piece of, uh, groundbreaking project. Uh, the, the reason for that is because it's really transformed our, our understanding and really gained a lot of insight around how our population health needs are, are, um, are um, currently um, taking, uh, taking place and how does it change over time. Brilliant. I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in that, so welcome. Karen. Thank you. My name's Karen Kirkham. I'm a GP still practicing and I have a number of other roles. Um, so I work with Dorset CCG as the Assistant Clinical Chair and then more widely across Dorset as the Integrated Care System Clinical Lead. Um, I'm also a locality chair, so in effect I'm, uh, I've been steering a, one of the emerging primary care networks. Um, and then in the last year I'm working with NHS England uh, as a National Clinical Advisor in primary care. I've been really working on the evolution and development of the primary care networks that have just been uh, released in the GP contract. And a hot topic that we're often asked about, so delighted you're here. Thank you. Trevor. Dirk, hi. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Trevor Pert. Um, I'm a Vice President with IBM Watson Health. Um, I lead for, uh, for IBM Watson Health on their consulting division, so I run consulting services outside of the states uh, in terms of healthcare generally. Um, I particularly, I'm particularly interested in the population health agenda and what that starts to do in terms of driving integrated care organisations. Because before I came into IBM, um, I was a chief exec in the NHS and was for 15 years. Um, the last six, seven years of that, um, I was involved in running integrated care organisations mm -hmm. in Wales and have been a policy advisor both in terms of Wales and in terms of the department here. Thank 
you, so a wealth of experience to tap into. Um, so audience, do take advantage um, of this breadth of um, expertise in thinking through your own questions and what you really want to hear about. Okay, so to start with a few questions just um, from us at the fund. Um, so population health management, it's a term that's used very often and I've heard it used in different ways. Um, Karen, just to start by asking you, what, what do you mean when you hear the term or use the term population health management? Thank you. So I think population health management will have a, a different, um, you'll get a different answer from each of us. But for me, this is using the data that we have um, in a different way, linking data sets between primary and secondary and, and local authority in the wider sense to try and help us to uh, target care, to look at where gaps in care, um, care are occurring, to help us to deliver care in a more proactive way to, to those people who, who need it most, um, and to think about the prevention agenda so that we're actually starting to, to, to tackle um, problems that patients have before they become very severe clinical problems. So, it, 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 enable our, it enables us really to use data to make intelligent decisions, to start thinking about not just targeting, but how we recreate and redesign service improvement. Um, but, but really importantly, how also we can improve the well-being of the workforce that deliver care to our populations by working in a different way together instead of in the traditional silos that exist. So two key things really that you're saying, one is the rich data that already exists, the assets to help inform our practice, but also the need to look much more widely um, and health being a much broader concept, which I'm sure we'll explore further. Thank you. Um, so Abraham, to ask you then, um, what do you think are some of the key ingredients for a successful population health management approach? Thank you, Toka. I think uh, population health management is akin to us becoming and striving to become a learning health system where we're having a continuous iterative process of trying to improve health and well-being outcomes and health and well-being needs. Uh, and, through, and that's through integrating our need for doing research and then, uh, and then applying back to clinical practice or public health practice. So I think there are a number of critical enablers starting with the concept of joint control. So for example, local organizations coming together, which we're doing right now in Kent, and actually coming together for different purposes around what we want to use data for, but aligning that in terms of actually having a consistent approach around instructing uh, our local organizations or what we call data processes to actually uh, uh, use data, uh, use and process data for analytical purposes. Linked to that is the other issue around how do we actually uh, design and, and, and structure or frame the right sort of questions. We're really good at framing questions around what's happened in the past, but I think it's all about how can we make things happen. It's all about what if. Mm -hmm. How, if we were to implement uh, integrated care, what would be the impact in terms of reduction in healthcare demand and healthy life expectancy, for example? Uh, there's a really useful uh, analogy, uh, uh, a useful uh, sort of um, um, a diagram called the Gartner Analytic Consumer, which is available in the public domain. So, and you you can easily find it on Google. The other things are obviously that are important is around workforce development. So how do we actually improve analytical capability? We've got lots of analytical teams that are dotted around the landscape within a particular system. How do we bring them together and harness the expertise? Mm -hmm. They're not all going to be trained in the same way, but they. But if we bring them together, they will complement in terms of actually de 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 developing and delivering an overall analytical functionality for the integrated care system going forward. And, but it's important that we don't just uh, focus around linking data across uh, within the healthcare system and referring back to the, the importance of the Dahlgren and Whitehead wider determinants of health uh, uh, model. Uh, there is health and there's a lot of administrative data across the wider determinants of health, particularly education, housing and employment that can also be linked with healthcare data to really understand what are the opportunities of uh, intervening and investing in health further upstream. Mm. Linked to all of that as well is around our broader agenda around how do we build up an R&D or research and development functionality for the integrated care system. That we can't really do things just using our existing analytical teams which are already under so much pressure in doing their day job. There are opportunities where we can link in with the broader uh, technology, private industry, yeah. as well as with uh, universities who can actually add value and bring a lot more analytical expertise to 
uh, deliver health, uh, to do the right sort of analytics or applied analytics to improve health and well-being needs of the population. Thank you. And I can see we're already being asked questions about how you've worked across so many organisations to connect this up, because I know practically on the ground, having tried it, um, the, the reach that you've had is phenomenal. So let's come back to that, if I may, and just ask you first, Trevor. Um, so population health management, um, we've talked about what it is and some of the key ingredients, but what's the benefit to staff and the public? I think there's two ways of looking at it, Dirk. I think, I think the starting point is that is the population health management as a technique, as a philosophy, as a tenant, is what underpins the drive now towards integrated care systems and organisations. So it's a, it's a, it's a necessary tool uh, by which those organisations can establish and move forward. Um, it's primarily, in, in, in my view, around how we focus on people. It's around how we, how we actually coordinate risk and care. Uh, and it's actually how we have a dynamic management of a system as a whole, rather than individual transactional issues that we've had historically. Uh, I, I think I would, I would summarise it in, in four basic areas. So I think there's an element about it's the health and well-being of the population that live in specific place-based um, areas. So there's, it's about fundamentally understanding the equity and the equality that actually happens in there and then driving your services accordingly. It's a focus on... Um, early detection, early intervention. Um, it's a focus on prevention, particularly right back into schools and public health and a whole range of educational issues. It's a focus on lifestyle. Um, and it's actually, we, we mustn't lose sight, it's also about how do we empower the individual. Uh, I know empower is a word that is used, is used a lot, but it is, I think, a real opportunity with population health. Um, whether it's via app development, whether it's by the new systems that are coming into place, mm. to give individuals a say in how they, one, receive treatment um, and actually how they look to be a partner in how their care is delivered. Mm. And that is something that we hear so often through the work that we're doing, so the work we did on transformational change, um, how these changes enable staff and changing that dialogue is between patients, public, staff, is, is critical isn't it so thank you okay so taking that a step further um, I know both of you have been involved in, in senior leadership positions in the integrated care agenda um, do you want to just give us a, a, a summary maybe of some of the insights that you've got from that that relate to population health management Karen I might ask you as well if yes, that's thank all right you. So, so I can really um, speak to my experiences in Dorset um, so in Dorset, when we, we started our journey several years ago, really starting to think about um, a case for change and doing things differently, and fundamentally um, that, that was pivotal to understand the health, um, the changing needs of our population, but also starting to, to, to think about how we address inequality and drive up standards um, of care. And it started to help us to understand not only where our needs were, but where we needed to do some of that workforce redesign and where we wanted um, uh, patients to be looked after uh, in a more seamless, joined up way, but it, as close to their natural community as possible, starting to think about the out of hospital um, model of care. And that allowed us to restratify our population and then start to develop new care models around looking after people, not just with complex frailty, yeah. but also long term condition management and, and down to, to uh, thinking about the care that was needed around specific populations, urgent care, and so on. Yeah. Um, and um, we have have now started to invest in that work. We have started to really start um, improving the use of our data and think about the linked data sets around that so that we can bring that to primary care level. Um, and uh, we are seeing some early signs that that approach is, is starting to reap benefits. Um, it's very complex, requires a great deal of organisational change and commitment to a long-term view, mm. uh, which is also, I think, something that we, we need to be really mindful of, that when we're starting to change the way that we deliver care, mm. um, it, it takes a lot of collaboration, it takes a lot of vision um, for each individual organisation to come together to deliver care in a different way. You. And Trevor? I think when we, when we established our first integrated care organisations in mm. Wales, a, a lot of what you've said is I completely, completely support. It, it was around three basic tenets. It was around infrastructure, it was around intelligence and around, around intervention. Um, and if you take the first one, if you take infrastructure, 
It was, it was clearly understanding how organisations are going to work together. What is the delivery mechanisms for care? What's the delivery mechanisms for actually how we're going to identify what the care pathways need to look like? Um, there's the issues regarding uh, integrated clinical records, the issues regarding a single version of the truth. You know, how, how does data actually um, move around and in the system? Um, it, it's clearly around not just not just the structure though and the technical issues, it's around the governance of the structure. Yeah. And the more partners you start to engage, the more the issues regarding assurance, accountability, uh, become key f functionality issues around how you move some of this forward. Now, in terms of the intelligence, that's fairly straightforward. It's the analytics. It's understanding where you can actually apply cognitive analytics, where you can start to look to do smart work in terms of predictive, uh, to make sure that as you're redesigning your structure and your system, you're actually able to understand what you think your system is going to require in five and ten years' time and design accordingly. You know, part of the whole issue about moving to an integrated care system um, and moving into population health is, is the shift left. It's, it's moving away from a hospital-based centric system of care to one which is much more around primary and community and early mm. intervention. Mm. Uh, and then the final one in terms of those interventions is around the care model. I touched earlier on about the focus on people. Uh, and it is around the needs, the value, the working with to understand what those new pathways need to look like, where you can have the interventions, where you need to step back and let people take control of their own lives. So those are the three areas that when we set up the first of the health boards in Wales were fundamental drivers for actually what the shape of the system was going to look like. Thank you. So between what you've both said, it actually sounds like some of the essence of this and making it transformative, and we'll come back to what you said, is actually about making a difference to the public. And it's not about the data in itself, but it's intelligent ways to meet the needs of the public in a way that they want closer to home um, and make the lives easier for staff. Um, and so a question back for you, Karen, if that's OK. Um, this comes from Donald Collins. Um, I'm jumping into questions a little bit earlier um, because I think this one's relevant for now, but I will come back to the, the audience questions. And um, So something about how can we help our GP colleagues um, to actually make this make sense and become part of business as usual? And I guess it links to your work in terms of primary care networks as well. Um, so you might want to say a bit about what you think the benefits of that are as well. Thank you. So I think primary care networks and the evolution um, of them over the next of the over the next few years, and the maturity of them is going to be absolutely pivotal um, to driving change, not just at general practice level, but thinking about primary care networks being the building block for all of our integrated care systems going forward. So they are very fundamental, very important um, parts of our system going forward. So. Um, they are networks of 30 to 50,000 head of population. Um, they will consist of groups of GPs uh, working together collaboratively around a number of areas. Um, and as networks mature, um, uh, um, they will start to increase the partnership working with other members of their community. And that will include community health services, mental health services, acute sector um, services. Um, and increasingly in the maturity with local authority partnerships, um, voluntary sector, patients as part and routine of, of uh, the, the partnerships. Um, and then as they mature even further, probably fire education, housing and their local communities. So I paint a picture really that starts to describe general practice being key and fundamental to playing its part um, within our, our primary care networks and with population health management as being critical to uh, understanding the needs of their population, addressing where there are gaps in care, as I've said, but also starting to target interventions mm -hmm. where it can't be just delivered by general practice alone and it needs partnership working around local communities mm -hmm. to enable service redesign and reprovision to take place. I, th I think this is a big step for most GPs who are struggling with enormous amounts of workload, uh, never mind thinking about um, a new approach um, to the population health needs of their local communities. But in fact, I think when I talk to most GPs, they, they really get it and it's not like this is a new concept. We are already risk stratifying. We are already addressing um, different populations in different ways. This just takes it one step further and it asks local systems, integrated care systems, STPs, to start putting that, integ that integrating that data set 
and then giving it back to general practice so that they can use it in a way that you can understand the total resources mm -hmm. uh, in a health system. So I think when I go out and talk to GPs, mm -hmm. they understand it, they will be good at it, they really want to improve care for their patients, and this is a tool to enable that to happen. And now with the primary care network mm -hmm. um, development, it gives them the support around them to enable to do things differently. Thank you, and I think you described it beautifully um, in terms of it being a building block, um, and so much exists. And but even things like primary care network, it being a building block for a wider population health approach. Um, and then there's questions which maybe we'll come back to in terms of what about the other bits of the system? How does it fit with things like the integrated care systems and at other levels? But maybe we'll come back to that because I know yes. we had a conversation yes. about that earlier. Um, okay, so Abraham. Um, the work that you've been doing in Kent, I think that, well, there's been a lot of interest here in terms of how you're working across the organisations um, that you are, because it's a phenomenal reach. Um, I think you said 200 GP practices, secondary care, but you've also moved into hospices and things like that. So would you mind saying a little bit more about that work um, and maybe some of the bits about um, risk stratification or population segmentation, so how you've clustered um, people to make them um, receive better support? Thank you, Doka. So uh, the, the journey that I went through started about six, seven years back. Uh, we were originally invited by the Department of Health at that time. We were was called the Quip Agenda, Quality Innov Improvement Productivity Prevention. And uh, we were doing a lot of w data linkage work as far back then, uh, trying to understand uh, the effect of risk stratifying our population, understanding how much resources were being utilized and gener or rather generated, particularly around healthcare demand. Mm -hmm. And what we were able to demonstrate was the effect of multimorbidity uh, by using risk stratification tools to understand res to understand resource utilization and we could see an exponential um, increase in, uh, in uh, non-elective healthcare demand, particularly on those high-risk uh, population. As a result of that uh, early work, we were then invited to become an early, early implementer site for the National Long-Term Conditions Year of Care program. And in that, we, we sort of expanded, uh, started linking up data across lots of other organizations, for example, hospices that you mentioned. Uh, at the, uh, and up till about, uh, say, last year, the Kent Integrated Dataset actually involved more than 200 organizations, uh, most of them GP practices, but also the, the big NHS providers, the Acute Trust, Community Health Trust, Mental Health Trust, um, and also Adult Social Care in Kent County Council. So we were able to get a, a sort of generate a sort of very elaborate mosaic of mm -hmm. how resource utilization was occurring across the different system. Uh, while uh, over the last two years, what's happened particularly is that now we've entered into the STP or integrated care system mode, where uh, it's actually compelling us to work together as both commissioners and providers coming together to work together as a system. Mm -hmm. So that's actually, I think, a positive uh, step forward. Uh, and it's, ha it's en engendering a lot of conversations which are really making us to think how do we actually work together and stop uh, and start, uh, start to minimize all of the other sort of barriers that have uh, faced us in the past around working together. One of the key areas that we are trying to do is around uh, having a collaborative approach and having one particular uh, sort of forum where we can discuss about analytics. So we call it the STP, uh, Shared Health and Care Analytics Board, uh -huh. where both commissioners and providers are actually represented. And in that board, we're actually talking about how do we start to bring analytics together? How do we develop the research agenda? How do we develop the analytical workforce? How do we become system thinkers? Uh -huh. And I think the the sort of uh, moniker that, or the, rather the, the, the sort of um, the, the headline that I'd like to try and push forward is systems thinking for population health. But very critically in that board, we are also talking about governance. That links back to one of the critical enablers that I was mentioning earlier on. So how can we develop joint control or a partnership approach in, in uh, collaborating around shared purposes and, and then instructing our different uh, providers, uh, data processes who are linking data together. Uh, ideally, we would like to have one data processor creating one information asset that would become one, one version of the truth. But in reality, it's not like that in the system. We've got several uh, data processors who are actually creating several linked data sets. So what we're trying to move towards to is an agreed version of the truth mm. rather than one version. 
and that we have an e a collaborative economy where we're working in partnership and one information asset is complementing what the development of one information asset is complementing the development of another information asset. Mm. So that's where we're, we're at. So and, and trying to conflate information assets for multiple purposes, say for commissioning or for direct care or for research is quite challenging. And I think if we develop a collaborative economy where we have several or more than two information assets or linked data sets, uh, but you being used for uh, different purposes, if I think might be a, a way forward. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to build on that, but I just want to um, address Rachel Clark's question from the Royal Osteoporosis Society. Um, Rachel's asked, what's the name of the diagram that Abraham referred to earlier? Um, so it's the Dahlgren and Whi Whitehead diagram, um, also known fondly amongst the public health community as the rainbow model, um, which talks about an ind all the different factors that impact on a um, individual's life, um, health, basically. Um, so physical, mental, social well-being, and I think actually you beautifully described a number of things, including fire, education, you know, environment. Um, I'm going to come to Trevor, if that's okay, um, to ask you um, a question which kind of links to, to some of what Abram's already describing about the sheer potential that already exists. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, you know, the technology to do a lot already exists. Why do you think we haven't been able to create these linked data sets or move further um, in the health and care system already? I, I, think, th I think there are two answers to that. There's the technical answer, uh, which is around the longitudinal patient record. Mm -hmm. um, and we still haven't, in most, in most areas, got to a situation where we have a, uh, a single record that runs from hospital through community to GP. And we still work in, in glorified isolation, if we're being completely candid. Uh, and I think the move to actually having um, electronic patient records, electronic medical records, will actually start to affect that. Uh, and that makes it much easier to begin to understand when and where to intervene and actually where people have actually been treated in the system. So, so there's an element regarding that and the platforms for that exist. The cloud exists, the, the cyber security exists for that now. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a second answer to the question. Um, and that's, I'm not convinced at the moment we've got real joined up strategies. Um, so when you look at individual partner organisations that are working in SDPs, um, I'm not convinced as yet that we've got that clear uh, understanding across all those partner organisations about where the priorities are, where they start from, and actually what the outcomes are. Mm. Uh, and we touched, we touched before we started to, in terms of, of, of this today, that there's an element for me also around the incentives in the system need to be aligned. You know, we, we, we have performance measures. Um, performance measures actually aren't particularly helpful unless we know what the outcomes are that we're actually striving to achieve. And so in the same way as we need to align the longitudinal record, um, we need to have that clear single strategy in terms of place-based care. Um, and, and we also need to understand what the outcomes are that we're actually then going to engage the risk around, the financial flow around, mm. and the new models incentives around. Mm. Thank you. And as you're speaking, it reminds me of what uh, Professor George Tadros from Birmingham said almost this time last year when he was speaking to us. It's almost that the measures that you're talking about, uh, it's how they're used as well, mm. um, to, to encourage and energise around improvement um, rather than almost be used to kind of um, be, be a stick? Well, uh, we measure what we can measure at the moment, yeah. and, and uh, it, it doesn't really gain us this situation about improving the outcomes mm -hmm. that I think all of them on this panel want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the focus on outcomes um, and how you then move the system, how it's incentivized mm -hmm. to actually achieve those outcomes, mm -hmm. is part of the mechanism that we're not seeing yet. Yeah. Thank you. So, building on that, but with the primary care focus. So we've got a question from Esther Mariku um, from Middlesbrough, who's asking, well, actually, when the GP practices um, are themselves not necessarily coterminous geographically, how do we do this? Um, well, I think one of the uh, really important things for GP practices to start thinking about as they develop into their networks is that actually, although they may not be absolutely coterminous, they do need to work around natural geographies. Um, because 
everything else works in a natural geography um, around a, a community in a community setting. So it's really important that through the next few weeks, particularly as GP practices are starting to uh, coalesce around the, where they are going to have meaningful relationships with other surgeries, that 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 pretty much has to be a geographical um, community around, around. So it wouldn't make sense at all for um, scattered practices to try and and. and take part in population health management if they are if they are geographically diverse and also if they're not located where, where their other community partners are. So uh, the real um, drive is, is that we try and make meaningful communities of care which involve general practices and their wider partners. So I think it's, it's a critical, it's a good question, but it's a critical building block to a, a secure and strong um, primary care network is that there is that that meaningful uh, geographical coterminosity um, that will exist. And, and the other thing is that the, the primary care networks, there can't be any gaps. So in terms of covering all population, they have to be absolutely aligned with their, there'll be a network of networks, not overlapping, no donuts in the middle of, of practices that aren't working with anyone else. It really needs to, there needs to be some thought about where it's gonna work more meaningfully for patients. Thank you. And then a question for you, Abraham, um, from Padmanabhan uh, Bandranath, um, who says, how easy was it to, outcome, um, to overcome various barriers uh, relating to data sharing across NHS, social care, public health, other sectors? I guess they measure different things, they've got different identifiers, there are different rules. Um, how, how did you find it possible, or how easy was it to overcome the barriers? Uh, very difficult, I think. Um, so, uh, it, and it's taken a huge amount of time, many years actually. And and I would, I'd still struggle. At actually, was there a shortcut method, or a much more shorter time span in which bringing all of that data together? In hindsight, uh, but generally speaking, I think the first ish, major issue was governance. You know, there isn't any. There isn't any setup. There isn't any established governance arrangements for both health and social care to actually work together in sharing data within a defined health economy. Um, I think we're we're making some progress around that right now. Now that we are moving towards an integrated care system, but secondly, even if we bring all the data together, as you ma rightly mentioned, the the issues are around uh, uh, whether whether the uh, whether this compatibility in terms of using the same patient identifier. That particular ch uh, challenge exists because of the fact that the legal basis in, in putting in patient identifiers, particularly in non-NHS data sets, is, as far as I'm aware of, is not well established. Um, and there are lots of uh, restrictions around that. And if we start to develop national policy to try and mitigate the, uh, those uh, barriers around the assigning of uh, patient identifiers like NHS number on non-NHS data sets, that will really help uh, to a great uh, deal. Once you even link the data, obviously data quality issues are a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of data sets are, are actually extracted from or abstracted from administrative data which have been largely used for performance measurement for that particular organization. The, the ultimate goal, what we're trying to do is actually create a research ready real world data set that we can use for a, for a variety of population health analytics um, and that's going to be a challenge when uh, all these different data sets follow uh, what we use the term data dictionaries. Mm. So uh, the commissioner sort of data sets like uh, it's called SUS or secondary use of services data set, which is the sort of data set that's compiled uh, nationally by NHS Digital, but uh, it originates from local um, trust organizations. That goes through a lot of um, sort of data cleansing and a lot of steps in terms of uh, data uh, improvement in data com uh, completeness and data quality. But when you start to link up data that's not routinely used for commissioning, uh, they haven't been subjected to those kind of rigorous standards and obviously we need to then uh, channel all the necessary resource and capacity locally to try and uh, manage all of that data quality improvement and data completeness. So data dictionaries, com uh, uh, incompatible data dictionaries is a big uh, issue and we're still working our way through that. Uh, but once we've uh, got to a reasonable level of um, say st a set of standards in terms of linking data and then we we come to a point where we can actually start to do some meaningful analytics. At the moment we are able to do a lot of useful 
work around population segmentation, risk stratification. So, for example, looking at the level, varying levels of multiple, uh, multiple morbidities in the population. So that's something we can do. But going forward, uh, in the integrated care system, I would think that prescriptive analytics or you know, sort of doing sort of simulation and impact kind of modeling kind of analytics, that becomes the norm, not the exception. And we need to really move towards a system-wide approach, a, 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 a system-wide approach in terms of developing a data dictionary mm -hmm. to actually map out what are the different care functions in the system that we would want to simulate in terms of understanding if we were, say, to invest in prevention, how would that have an impact in healthcare demand? If we were investing more in assessment or treatment or rehabilitation, how would that have an impact in healthcare demand? So you've just beautifully painted a journey from where you started, where you've gone to, the hard work that it's taken, the time to have all those connections and conversations, work through the barriers, and then a future that's going to continue. Um, so, so that's brilliant but it means that anyone who's earlier on in the journey just keep going is, is almost what I'm uh, what I'm hearing thank yeah. you um, so Trevor I was going to um, come to you if that's all right um, you talked about measuring success earlier because it sounds like we've got data hmm. there's something about data quality is that data sufficient to be able to measure success no not, not, not as it's currently structured, and I think it's seamlessly following on from what you've just saying. I think the conversations around predictive modelling um, is actually the stage for actually how we start to use analytics. More importantly, is is it's we're, we're quite good at measuring and capturing what we're doing now. What we're not necessarily good at is actually taking that and actually taking it into the future. Um, and I think the two things I just wanted to build on on that last point around. One was predictive analytics, uh, particularly as you start to link the data sets in health, social care and in, in um, public health more generally, uh, start to give us an opportunity in terms of how you reshape the system. Um, is that one of the advantages I think that the STPs will take us to, or I would hope they will take us to, um, is, is future proofing our system so we don't do this again. Um, so, so what does the structure within an organisation or set of organisations look like in 10 years' time? And what's the journey that we need to go on to get us there? And the bit we've, we've touched on a little bit on the, in some of the answers is the workforce redesign. Mm. You know, we know the pressures we have in our workforce, particularly in primary care, uh, but also with, with in terms of hospitals as well. Mm. Um, and if what we're going to do is use that data effectively in a secure way, to shape what we think the demand for our population at a local level is going to look like, um, then the workforce needs to be modelled accordingly as well. So, putting it simplistically, how many doctors do we need? How many GPs do we need? What does actually community professionals start to look like that can take up some of those roles so that actually we can mitigate against workforce drought in the future? So, so the next stage about taking the data that you've actually got and, and then adding predictive metrics to that that starts to say simplistically you know, how many hospital beds do we need for this population in this discipline um, is, a, is a fundamental way of where I think our investment plans for the next decade are actually going to go. Thank you. Um, and building on the workforce aspect, so we've had two um, inputs. Um, one comment which I think is really important um, from Sarah Amby um, from Healthwatch England, which is to remind everyone that actually Healthwatch exists locally and nationally to, to really support with some of this. Um, and I think that's another key player to remember. Um, but also, I mean, in our own work, um, for example, just with the GSK um, Impact um, Award charities, it's phenomenal work that's happening in the voluntary sector. Um, so what are your thoughts in terms of them as part of the workforce and their future or current contributions? Well, well I think they're, they're absolutely a partner uh, in the same way we touched about the, the, the population more generally being a partner. Uh, I think if we're, the, the, the more we can include the individual and the representation from the individual within our design, um, then the easier it becomes for change. Mm. Is that certainly, from my experience, where we've actually had ongoing meaningful debate with our populations, uh, rather than surprise changes to service delivery models, 
um, then, then actually it's something which actually meets with most people's expectations. And if they've got the ability to influence how that service is actually going to be designed and delivered, and Healthwatch is, is, is fundamentally part of that, um, as are the charitable sector, who will be delivering a lot of our services in, in the future as they do now, mm. um, then they, they, that, that wider general population um, of outside health and social care needs to be a fundamental part of our delivery mechanism. Thank you. And Karen, you can I just build on that? Please, um, yeah. So I think the voluntary sector have a critical part to play um, in the evolution of our STPs and our integrated care systems um, in, a, in a number of ways, really. So first of all, they're a huge untapped resource. Um, they are, they want to be part of our community, they want to be part of the delivery of, of a different way of working. And we need to remember that they also um, have huge resources in terms of being able to um, enable uh, much more non-medical support to our population. So we, we've got to move away from it all being medicalised and we've got to start thinking about what's best for people and communities. Um, and the voluntary sector have a, an absolutely enormous role to play um, in that. And just a, a particular specific around um, the voluntary sector is thinking about how they support the first tranche of our new uh, workforce developments around primary care networks, which in the first year is around clinical pharmacist development, but also social prescribers. Absolutely. And so and there's, a, there's a real reason for that, because you know we can develop that quickly. We know that not everything has to come through a hospital, through an urgent care service, through a GP door. And they have an, an, there's an enormous potential for us to grasp a hold of their skills at, at local community levels to support local people. Mm -hmm. So a uh, really, really good point, uh, and, uh, and it's happening now. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna actually stick with you for a second, if that's all right, if I may, um, because quite often when people are talking about population health management, and there's certainly um, a question here about where do you start, because some of this can seem really long-term. Um, there's a bit of a debate about which segment, and quite often it's multimorbidity, complex needs, older people, but actually you've got an interest in maternity, um, and can you um, say a little bit more about some of the work in that area and why that's important to you? So maternity and early years, yes. really, if we start putting together the importance of the best start for um, babies, mm. the best start for um, mother and baby, mother, father and baby attachment um, and thinking about giving children the very best start in life. Uh, in Dorset we've been doing a bit of work uh, as an early adopter around personalisation of care and really started to change the care model to ensure that during the first month particularly um, of, of uh, a baby's life is that there was, there was an enhancement really in, in the care that was delivered to, to families around that. Um, and also thinking about this whole um, idea about personalisation of care for mothers and fathers and new families um, coming together. And I think increasingly as I look around the country, so not just in Dorset, but as I look around the country, people are starting to recognise that actually probably the greatest impact we can make is giving children the very best start in life. Um, and that starts obviously preconceptually. Mm. Um, so there's an awful lot that we can do to um, sort of to think about how we improve care for, for new mums. Uh, and support them with mm. attachment and bonding and security mm. um, through those, those early, early weeks. But really to the wider agenda, it, it, it almost doesn't matter where you start because every local community will have um, a different view on where their priorities lie. Um, we can, and we can think about priorities at a system level across a, a million or two, or we can think about priorities at a network level of 30 to 50,000. And it's, it's about what's meaningful for those populations to, to, uh, to, to take forward. Um, and I think my, my tenement really is just wherever it makes sense to start for a local primary care network and its local community, wherever you identify where there are gaps or that services can, be, um, can look different, then I would say just start there because once you start developing the, the different culture, the organisational change that's needed, you embed a new way of working, you start developing relationships and trusting relationships between partners to deliver care differently. Mm -hmm. um, once you've done that um, once, it becomes very much easier to, to, to start on another uh, element. So if you think about it in those terms, um, I would just say just start anywhere, but, but start okay, somewhere. So local ownership, but local let's ownership. not forget um, vulnerable communities and also maybe segments that we wouldn't necessarily think about. So when we think of risk, accumula uh, risk accumulation, actually some of the early life, um, early year start is so important. 
um, and not, we don't want to lose it in, in the context of the current demands as well. I think you wanted to just contribute. Just, just the final thing on, on, on that, I think the other thing from experience as well was fund it properly. Is, is, is that when, when we were starting to engage with the third sector, in, certainly in South Wales, um, historically it, it's, we would fund it for a year and then withdraw it. Um, so there's an element about understanding that, if, uh, about sowing flowers and how many grow, is, is, is that you need to do this seriously mm -hmm. and over a period of time. Uh, so don't fund it for one year and then withdraw it, fund it for three to five years and you'll get the benefit. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to come to you, Abraham. Um, there's a couple of technical questions. I guess that the nature of this topic is that we will have some very technical questions in much more conceptual and principled time. So a couple of technical questions. Um, firstly, from Hiral Mehta, um, who says, how did you manage to link data sets? That's, that's first one. Um, and then a question from Nick Turner, who's from Ealing Council, who says, how did you, um, how were you able to build an organization with the necessary skills to link, cleanse, and analyze all the data? So a bit about the technical, how did you do it? Um, so it's never been one department or one team doing everything. It's always a collaborative approach between a number of organizations. So in Kent, we were very fortunate for many years that we've had a data warehousing service uh, that, was prov uh, that was provided to all the uh, local acute provider, uh, not all, but, but at least three or four of the local acute providers. So there was a data warehousing team that was based in one of the local acute trusts and we and they acted as our uh, trusted third-party data processor right at the beginning, and uh, basically they were doing the data warehousing for these uh, local NHS providers. What we just asked them to do: Can you also create a linked data set on top of that uh, data warehousing functionality that you're already providing? And so they did that within their own existing uh, capacity and resource. Um, we did it slowly, obviously, because there wasn't we didn't have a huge sum of money or a funding pot to actually in, you know, do it in a sort of big bang approach. So we did a slow but steady approach. But we, uh, over a period of two to three years, uh, we've managed to then com uh, compile a huge data set across for, for the Kenton Medway population, which is roughly 1.9 million population. So, um, and in that regard, uh, we were able to, when we first started off, the the way we were, the legal justification of bringing that data was for a public health, uh, for a public health intelligence purpose, linking JSNA, as well as the uh, the provision of statutory public health or health improvement services. So we started off with that. Going forward now, as an integrated care system, we would want to start to look at uh, a much more broader, more robust governance arrangement, which is the joint controller uh, um, uh, legal justification that I mentioned earlier on. It's all uh, mentioned and acknowledged in, uh, in the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulations, uh, which is set in Brussels. So, um, so there, is a, there is provision for us to do all of that. Apart, uh, so it was very much public health department in Kent County Council working in close collaboration with the, uh, the what well, we call them HISBI. The HISBI is the data warehousing team, which is based in one of the local acute trusts known as uh, in Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust. So we worked with them for many years in trying to bring that data set together. Mm -hmm. And through that, we then sort, sort of managed some of the, uh, the technical issues around data quality, data completeness, some of the data linkage uh, challenges as well. Uh, going forward now, uh, the, the landscape has changed significantly, considering that the CCGs have contracted a, uh, an outside uh, third party organization known as Optum. So they're going to be developing the uh, commissioning data set for, for commissioning purposes. What we want to make sure is that uh, now that we are an integrated care system, that when we create linked data sets, even if, uh, even if we're creating more than one, we are actually having a collaborative approach in, uh, so that each linked data set development complements one another and that we're not trying to prejudice or uh, uh, increase the risk of, uh, no, it's not, it's our data set mm. or it's your data set and you know, mm. we want to try and collaboratively work together to do that because in the end we are now commissioner and provider mm. working together as one integrated care system. Thank you. And I think there's something really important about your public health team and the essential contribution that they have provided in bridging that gap 
you know, between the data, the third party, the system, um, and uh, if we'd had more time, I would love to explore that more because I think there's a really interesting discussion about the role of public health in all of this. Um, but I'm going to come to Trevor, if that's OK. Come back to you. Um, so uh, basically, um, I've got a couple of questions which colleagues have been asking and, um, and we've had through other means as well, um, such as LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, so in terms of health inequalities, mm -hmm. um, there's a real opportunity for this to be able to help address some health inequalities but also potentially to widen it. And I know Wales in particular have been doing some work uh, on this with colleagues at the fund. Do you have thoughts about, about that? Yes, the Bevan Commission um, in, in Wales had a very clear starting point, which was around uh, the equity versus equality debate. Um, uh, and it was about ensuring that we actually brought uh, individuals within our communities up to at least a baseline level, rather than actually necessarily spreading uh, resources over over a wider population um, and, and I touched on it slightly earlier when I said about uh, being really clear and identifying what the priorities were in terms of the strategy for any local area uh, whether that's the 50,000 population whether that's the 250,000 or whether it's the million so so in terms of actually how you start to align both the analytics and the data you can align that to the priorities of actually what you're seeing as the areas um, of deprivation, of the need for investment, uh, both in terms of health and social care, um, and then ensuring that the partner organisations, including the third sector, are aligned to actually alleviate and, and avoid, well, certainly to avoid it getting any worse, um, and hopefully bringing up those parts of our community who we haven't targeted as effectively as we could do in the past uh, to the level that we want to see. Thank you. And I know there's some work even in, um, so we went to Coventry where there's obviously focus on health inequalities and deep end GPs are coming to a conference tomorrow. Um, so it sounds like a collective effort from a number yes. of people is what it's going to take. Yes, and I think, the, uh, the, I think the earlier point you were making about the third sector mm. and voluntary organisations to actually sit alongside statutory organisations in driving and engagement and involvement. Because mm. in many cases, actually, those areas are hard to reach groups as well. Mm. So the third sector has always been better mm. at actually reaching, deep diving into those areas yeah. uh, than actually the state sector has been. But working in harness together, using the data that you've actually pulled together in areas like you have in Kent and Medway, and then starting to look to see how you start to deploy that as you go forward, are all the fundamental areas of actually what integrated care organisations should start to do. Um, it's ensuring they've got the capability and the capacity to actually drive forward uh, and ensuring that you've got those sort of four cornerstones yeah. as they begin to grow that, are uh, that, that, that can be measured to ensure that it's the outcomes you're achieving and not just the targets you're trying to strive for. Thank you. Um, and final question in terms of um, our set, um, being to you, because I know you're very passionate about making a difference to um, the public and the staff we were even talking earlier. Um, so there was a question about how do we get staff to engage with this? Um, so do you have any thoughts um, about what approaches people can take to get you know, colleagues and staff across the system, across organisations, to really get behind some of this? Um, my personal view is that we need to um, make this commonplace language. So this needs to be um, part and parcel of absolutely everything that we do um, within, our, our, uh, within our health systems. And that means bringing this down to uh, creating um, a vision that people can understand, whether it's my receptionist in my surgery, whether it's my local counsellor, whether it's my consultant, whether it's my, my GP and my surgery. It's about having a really common understanding um, and breaking this down into the language that people do understand. And, um, and, and so that's really important. So I think the right narrative, creating the right vision, uh, creating uh, something that is tangibly different for patients and staff, um, and then seeing the benefit of that by following that up in, 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 a, in a quick cycle that, mm. that we know that what we're doing, the innovation that we're, that we're trying to put in place is actually giving us what we want mm. to see and see and we'll see tangible results. I think those are all really key um, building blocks in, in this piece of work. Thank you. What a powerful motivator that is to go, actually, it's making a difference. Yes. Thank you. Right, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, and so I just want to start bringing it to a close by giving
giving you the chance to say, through all of this discussion, or maybe something we haven't covered, um, what would you say is the one take-home message that you would like the audience to come away from this session, um, you know, really thinking more about? Shall we start with you, Abraham? I think it's, it's about systems thinking for population health. Uh, if, if you don't think in systems, then we, we run the risk of uh, being very, very uh, siloed and marginalized in terms of um, you know, uh, you know, uh, profiling the population, uh, commissioning a particular intervention or a care pathway. And we really need to ask ourselves very, very challenging questions. If we were to say, for example, implement social prescribing initiatives within a particular, say, primary care network. So we have to be realistic. Is that uh, we may have made our business case, we prepared our business case to uh, to invest in that social prescribing initiative and we've put in a, um, an assumption that it's going to reduce healthcare demand. Mm. The, the data, the linked data is supposed to help us to really understand, well, okay, if we have actually seen healthcare admissions coming down, is that really attributable, attributable to the social care prescribing, uh, sorry, social prescribing initiative? Mm. And actually, uh, one of the big areas of applied analytics we need to take into account, not just around risk stratification or um, um, uh, also you know, simulation and impact analysis, but also evaluation. So what works? Okay. And I think that's a really important uh, point. Thank you. Karen, what about you? I would say to anyone who's listening, um, what's your part to play within this? Nice. How, what do you bring to your organization, whether it's an enormous organization or a very small practice? What is your, um, what is your part to play, whether you're medical or non-medical? What do you need to help you develop those skills, um, and and think and and think about um, how you can bring the skills that you already have that you're already using to be part of this program that's going forward? Because this is not this is going to be a, a golden thread through that runs through everything that we do. Absolutely, thank you, and Trevor. I, I think it's all of the above. I, I, <laughs> I, I think that the, the, I, I would say there are, f I think, four basic areas that we've touched on during the course of the day, and I think it would be interesting for organisations that are listening to us, whether they be CCGs, whether they be trusts, whether they be STPs, around their own self-assessment of how far they're going. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that you know, we, we haven't got that in our system at the moment, um, but I think those four cornerstones of 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 um, staff and clinical engagement, you know, are we clear about where we're going, what our strategy is, uh, the issues regarding gov governance, assurance, an overarching partner strategy alignment. Uh, I think the third one is clearly around financial flows, or around risk appetite and around how do you incentivise the system. And then the fourth one is, and I left it deliberately to last, is actually around the technology. You know, is, is, are, you, are you having a longitudinal record? Have you got data warehouses? What's your security like? What's your data governance like? But those are the four areas I think any of these organisations should now be starting to assess. Because it's happening in pockets, but I'm not seeing it spread out widely across the service at the moment. Thank you. So it sounds like three challenges as opposed to reflections almost. Something about how we think, how we know we're doing the right thing in a mean, meaningful way. Something about actually we've all got a part to play, so you know, thinking about what that is. And then actually a call to why don't we just start by looking at what we're doing and how well we're doing and sure. just there and share. So um, that brings us um, very nearly at time. Um, clearly we had tons and tons of questions, more than I could have possibly got through. Um, thank you for sending them in and the diverse range of questions. Um, got through quite a few and, and touched upon a number of areas, uh, but what we will do is share these questions with our panel members and also with colleagues at the fund. Um, so to really be aware about what you're thinking about, what you want to know about, um, to help inform our thinking about the next pieces of work that we do to keep supporting. Um, also, just to say that if you've got colleagues who couldn't attend um, and watch this session live, um, do encourage them to um, register and they can watch on demand. Um, and then finally, um, and the nice bit, you know, really to thank our fantastic speakers. So Abraham, Karen and Trevor for all your contributions. Um, I enjoyed sitting here talking to you about this topic. Um, and thank you to our audience um, for all of your questions. Goodbye.